as much as people think that prenuptial agreements are weak, I don't believe that and I don't see that in my practice. Embrace your masculinity, embrace your femininity, and understand that there needs to be some polarization um, for a successful marriage, right? Um, that a, a brother is not impressed by a degree, okay? And a sister is not impressed by, um, you know, how much you can necessarily bench. So understand what the other person is looking for um, and use your marriage as a form of worship, um, as a form of raising children, and obviously, and obviously get a prenup. Dean lovers, welcome again to another episode. Uh, this is quite different than usual. We have um, uh, a very wonderful guest with us today, Brother Naveed Hussain. Um, how are you doing, Naveed? Alhamdulillah, brother. I'm doing well. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Thanks for, for, for the invitation. Let me introduce to you our guest today. Uh, Brother Naveed Hussain graduated from Marquette University Law. Um, he, is man he is the managing partner of uh, at Farooqi and Hussain LLC uh, on the legal committee of the Muslim Legal Fund of America located in Texas and the co-founder and instructor of NikahMasterclass.com. He focuses his practice in family of law and estate planning. Naveed is a Chicago native, shout out to, uh, to Chicago, and has completed uh, the Sheikh al Hind program at Darul Qasim. Um, so Alhamdulillah, you know, I, I was looking at your CV. Uh, what, what attracted me first was some of your videos on YouTube because I was um, mm. trying to figure out this whole issue of Muslim marriages and divorces from a legal aspect from someone from our community. And uh, it was quite difficult to find mm. until I strolled across your videos. I was like, wow. <laughs> and so there was like a, a, a vast um, a knowledge of information and, and it's refreshing um, to have somebody like you brother and may Allah bless you because you have it from both angles. You've studied the, the Islamic uh, jurisprudence when it comes to the, um, the, the marital aspect and the institution of marriage uh, from the Islamic perspective, but also you have um, knowledge and um, expertise in the legal aspect as well. Um, so that is amazing to hear. And so first thing first, let's get into it. Um, the first question I want to ask you is, how important do you think it is to know the the laws um, with regard to marriage as Muslims in America. So the legal system with regard to marriage, how important is it for Muslims to know that before getting married? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi nabi al-kareem. Najazakumullahu khairan for your invitation. I think it's a really important question because yeah. we are, unfortunately, as a Muslim community, ignorant um, of the law. And not only family law, but many, many areas of the law, subhanAllah. When you look at our, you know, traditionally speaking, access to the court and people with just regular knowledge of law was very common, right? The common person had access to the courts. They understood how laws worked. But unfortunately, as a Muslim community, we don't understand Islamic law, first and foremost. Um, and then secondarily, the laws of the land. And because what happens, right, when you get married um, under state law or in America, things that you never think about, things that aren't even crossing your mind actually happen when you get married, right? Because all of a sudden you get married and now your property is one, right? Um, your property is one. There's certain responsibilities and rights that take place that even if you get divorced can haunt you for many, many years. So... I think when it comes to family law 
And also the other area that I do estate planning, it's very important for us to understand the law of the land because it's so different than Islamic law. And the only way that we can implement Islamic law is by understanding American law so that we can work through that. Because in the Quran, for example, there's a sp specific way of how divorce is supposed to work. There's a specific way on how uh, distribution is supposed to happen. Inheritance is supposed to happen. But if you don't understand American law, there's no way that that's going to be implemented. Right. Um, I 100% I agree with you. Uh, unfortunately, um, the aspect of Muslims not knowing even Islamic you know, jurisprudence with regards to uh, marriage and getting into that type of institution is extremely dangerous. Um, there's a lot of uh, consequences. So what, what do you think are some of the consequences uh, with regards to being ignorant of one or either of the, of the two aspects? I mean, the consequences of not knowing Islamic law, number one, or even American law, I mean, just starting with Islamic law, right? Obviously, not understanding Islamic law, how are you going to get to Jannah, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us certain guidelines and a path on how we should get to Jannah. And we look at it as law, right? We think of it as a very narrow thing as law, right? Do this, don't do that. But what's beautiful about Islamic law versus American law is that Islamic law includes morality and akhlaq and adab and these other aspects of how to live your life versus American law, which just says you're allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that. So I think being ignorant of Islamic law is being ignorant of the path that Allah has given us to get to Jannah. And then obviously on the American side is that if you don't understand American law, you don't understand what happens when you get married, and now, God forbid, there's a divorce happens, okay? You're going to be very shocked, right, that a brother who spent his entire life working and saving his retirement account and buying this house and paying it off, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, at the time of divorce, he believes that this is all mine. I earned this. It's in my name. Islamically, it's his. But now, if you're ignorant of the American system and you go through the court system, what's going to happen? Half of that is gone. Half of that is going to go to your spouse. And so that adds an extra level of animosity during the divorce, um, where if you understood what you were getting into at the outset, you'll ex you, maybe you'll expect it, or maybe you would have done something like a prenup to avoid that. But now the consequences are half your money is gone. And then on top of that, there might even be alimony, right? Alimony, where now you may have to sp um, take care of your spouse for 10, 20 years, um, even after the divorce is over. Wow, uh, subhanAllah, and how true that is. All of those things are, are quite um, detrimental to, you know, individuals. And Islam did come to not only protect human beings, but it also came to protect their property. It's a very, very important thing. Allah. I love mentioned that the morality is intertwined in the moral fabric. So it's not like, or I'm sorry, the, the fabric, the institution of, of marriage, or just our whole lives, honestly, honestly. So in legal aspect, you're right, because in the Western realm, it's kind of like divorce. It's like, you know, it's not about legal, it's not about morality. This is about laws, and this is about, you know, following the books, the codes, and all those things. So it's a great, great point. Um, so now I want to get into what are the biggest and common mistakes that you've seen um, in your field or in your experience uh, within this institution of marriage and divorce? So, you know, I, of course. So as a divorce attorney, obviously people are coming to me when their marriages fail. So I have a unique insight into kind of what is causing that and what's behind that. And so I kind of look at it at different levels, right? Like I look at it from three different levels. So if you take it from the most broad, right, from the most broad in terms of societally speaking, you know, we have, we live in this capitalistic liberal society where it's all about you, okay? It's all about me, um, my freedom, my rights, and we've boiled everything down to the individual. And so you see a lot of problems occur in this individual individualism versus kind of the collectivism that Islam kind of asks for and what marriage asks for. So I think that 
a big problem is kind of the society and its influence on us as Muslims. I think kind of zooming in a little bit more, I think there's a lot of issues from maybe our parents who lived in the East, right? And their view on what marriage is and the cultural, you know, things that kind of seeped into what marriage is. And then now here us in America, where we're trying to shed some of the bad culture and try to practice a more pure Islam, you know, a lot of that cultural baggage can have impact on how we view marriage or what marriage really is. And then finally, on an individual level, you know, we're much more involved in looking at haram, listening to haram. We haven't been trained to be good husbands and wives. We've been trained to be good employees, right? Good entrepreneurs, but we have not been trained uh, to be good husband and wives. And how do we live in a family? How do we live in a society? And I think more practically speaking, I know that was a little abstract, but more practically speaking, I think the way it shows up is, number one, in-law issues, right? In-laws and third parties getting involved in your marriage is a very big problem in our Muslim community and is a very big reason for why people are getting divorced. Um, I think financially speaking um, is another big reason that we have many expectations that our life is going to be like Instagram, our marriage is going to be like Bollywood, and we're going to have this beautiful life. But my husband, he just makes 70000 SubhanAllah, saying like 70000 is some type of low salary, astaghfirullah. And, you know, my husband only makes 70000 I can't go and go on this vacation. I can't buy this house. I can't do that. So financial, uh, di you know, incongruence, I think, is a very big problem. And then finally, I would say, you know, problems of addiction and problems of like domestic abuse, right? Like uh, addiction to bad things online or drugs or gambling. Um, and also, of course, not being able to control your anger, which leads to then, you know, domestic violence and that type of thing. So I think, you know, I know that was a very long winded answer, but I think there's so many things that this institution of marriage needs to sit in that the society is just not providing. And, and this, is a, this is a great point because uh, you mentioned that we come from already cultures that have um, baggage, a lot of baggage. And people, you know, you know, Muslims are in the West have a problem with it, sometimes rightfully so. But at the same time, it's like we replace those problems with this problem. Like, you know, we throw out that luggage for this one. So it's kind of like, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of problems already happening in the West with Americans, um, non-Muslims. When you speak to them about stuff like this and you tell them about Islamic law when it comes to marriage, they're shocked. They're like, this is amazing. Really? <laughs> and we're like, yeah, you know, and then um, at the same time, we don't have this sort of is and this sort of, you know, um, a, a pride when it comes to, you know, our our heritage um, in, 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 in this realm. So this is a great point. And, and, and your answers, too, I appreciate them. There's, there's a lot of videos you have, and it's hard to keep on track with them. <laughs> But it's, no. it's so informative. Well, I, and so before we go, I'm going to plug uh, everybody in with you. Um, so now I want to get into something we call shotgun round. And so shotgun round is I'm going to hit you with just um, a couple of aspects and concepts and give us your um, um, 10 cents on that, inshallah. So the first yeah. thing is prenups. Okay. Yeah. It's a big one. Um, what is it? Educate us on it. What is it? When is it good to get it? And when is it probably not that important? Sure. So prenups, are, you know, just to define what a prenup is, it's an agreement between a husband and wife as to what happens if we divorce. Okay. That's, you know, in a simple way. And a lot of people, they say, oh, is this Islamic? Is this un-Islamic? I, I want us to think about our definition of marriage versus how the West defines marriage. Because... Islamically, a marriage is a sacred contract. It's a contract at the end of the day that you are agreeing to something in exchange for something else. Certain rights and responsibilities come because of that contract. And now, you know, there's ways to get out of that contract and et cetera, et cetera. So we have a contract-based theory of marriage, whereas the West has a unity theory that once you become married, and I talk about this in all my videos, that once you become married, you are now one person. So already we have a different paradigm. So a prenup is a contract. And so to say that it's un-Islamic, I don't know where that comes from. I actually believe that it is Islamic to have a contract that spells out 
what happens if we divorce? You heard of mu'akhar, for example. Um, but this is kind of expanding that idea of mu'akhar and what the terms of divorce are. So in a prenuptial agreement, you can define what property do you get? What property do I get if we get divorced? You can define, am I going to give, pay you alimony? Um, are you going to pay me alimony for how long, how much? You know, that could be defined. Um, you can define mahar. So for example, if you get married in a state with just a nikah nama or nikah papers from your masjid that says that your mahar is 30,000, your mu'akhar is 10,000, a, a judge might not even you know, look at that. So in order for us to implement the Islamic rulings of property, which is my property is my property, your property is your property. Yes, I have a right to support you during the marriage, uh, that which is customary. But that doesn't mean now that all my property is yours and your property is mine. Of course not. So that prenuptial agreement can define that, can define what's yours, what's mine. It can define um, how much alimony should there be, right? Islamically, once you give the divorce, you're supposed to provide nafaka for three months. Um, and really, that's it. I mean, yes, as a sister, if you want to negotiate more than that, you're more than welcome to. But that's only valid if it's part of an agreement, which I am saying that a prenuptial agreement can um, implement something like that. And then also the mahar. So I think that every Muslim should get a prenuptial agreement. That's the only way that the two of you can ensure that Islam is what is governing the marriage, but also what is governing the divorce, and that something crazy doesn't happen at the divorce. And here's the thing. A lot of people, they think when you sign a prenup, I'm giving up everything, right? A sister who you know is staying at home to raise the kids, she's not going to college. We're not saying that sign a prenup, you're going to get nothing, sister. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is have that conversation up front and decide what your mahar, uh, mahar is going to be. What, How much support do you need? Um, what property will you get? And whatever the two of you agree to, as long as there's no gharar, as long as there's no ambiguity, that's that's a legal Islamic contract. So I think that as, you know, mashallah, your platform, other uh, ulama, other scholars, they should really be pushing prenuptial agreements and requiring them um, for their congregants. So one one thing I've heard with, with regards to prenuptial agreements is that um, it it only holds weight if it is a like it has to do with wealth. It has to do with money and property. Like you can't make a prenuptial agreement on like, hey, if everything goes south. Um, in this agreement that we signed, uh, that the way we deal with our marriage will be according to Islamic law. Talk to me about that. Yeah, so that's the thing is that you're right, that a prenuptial agreement isn't used to dictate what happens during the marriage. Like, you don't say in the prenuptial agreement that I'm, you know, I'm the husband, I'm going to pay for all the bills, I'm going to give you $1,000 a month in spending money. That's not the point of a prenup. The point of the prenup is, what happens with our wealth if we divorce? Now, I do suggest that Muslims have like a nikah, you know, actual contract, right? That does talk about these things with the understanding that it's not enforceable. And the reason why the courts, is, the courts and the states don't want you talking about the day-to-day -day and who's paying for what is because what is the remedy? If you breach that contract, what happens? Divorce, right? Like the state can't, say, okay, husband, you agreed here to pay her $1,000 a month. And so now you have to pay her $1,000 a month. No, the court's going to say, well, this contract is about marriage. And so the breach will equal divorce. So um, I think the way to really deal with that is having a separate agreement between husband and wife about how that works. And, you know, I, I have a little bit of mixed feelings on this because I think that you should have a contract on how things will end. But it's going to be ever changing, right? Your marriage is always going to be changing. Today, I might have a job. Tomorrow, you might have a job. Today, things might, you know, like for me, I think that day-to-day -day aspects of a marriage really have to be communicated, negotiated, and be discussed on an ongoing basis. And to reduce that to a contract might sour the marriage a little bit. <laughs> you know, that's, that's just my, that's my thoughts on it. I'm not sure how you feel, but...
you're right that the prenup can only dictate what happens on divorce uh, that's, that's actually a good point um the way you uh, explain that uh, uh I, th I think i agree i think i agree with that that's a good point um the next issue is this this is um i don't know about your community in chicago but i know like within the Somali community, um, there there does seem to be this controversial uh, discussion that goes on, which is when we get married, do we go to the courts and get marriage papers or do we just have in the cat in the masjid? Mm -hmm. And talk about pros and cons or should you do it or should you not um, give us some uh, feedback? Sure. So many masajid in Chicago if you're going to get your nikah there, they actually require that you get a license. Um, so many uh, imams will not do a marriage in the masjid without the state license. So uh, unless you're trying to like go in your basement or do it at a wedding hall or something like that, you know, it's going to be a little hard. But I can see the I see the attraction of not getting the state involved. You know, like why would you want the state who has no morality be involved in such a beautiful institution? So I. I see the attraction, but I'm looking at it from a practical perspective. Practically speaking, the way that this system is built is there's some benefits, some benefits to being legally married, which, you know, like get on their health insurance, get certain inheritance rights, access to hospital, um, you know, birth certificates for the kids. There's certain benefits that come with being married. And so my opinion has been to do the state marriage along with a prenuptial agreement, right? So when you have the two, you get the benefits of the state, but you are now dictating how property and everything else works. The other thing is that if you get married without a license and now 10 years later, you want to separate. One of them decides, you know what? Yeah, I know we didn't get a legal marriage, but we live together. We filed joint taxes together. We did X, Y, Z together. So some states might have common law marriage and other states might have something called putative spouse, which is, yeah, I know you didn't get a license, but you, ha you did have a ceremony. You did live together. You did file your taxes together. So we're going to treat you like you're married anyways. So too bad, so sad. Right. But you could have avoided that if you had like a prenuptial agreement, for example. So that's been my opinion um, is do the state marriage with the prenup. But if somebody decides they're going to leave the state out of it and they understand that the practical stuff isn't going to be very easy, I don't blame them. You know, I wouldn't blame them. <laughs> yeah. You know um, what? I, I did have an issue with that um, about going to the, 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 the courts and everything and and getting marriage papers and license with them. One, I think uh, my chef mentioned one thing that uh, kind of made me think a little bit was, and maybe you could give us uh, um, your input on this, was about inheritance. So say if you die and you have kids, like if I die, you know, uh, we ask Allah for Hasul Khatima. If I was to die and I have kids and then my wife and we did not get any marriage papers with the courts, um, would, would they automatically view you as married and then work with you on inheritance that way? Or it's just you yeah. lost it? So that's a good question. So you don't necessarily lose everything, right? So what would happen in that case is that your wife wouldn't get anything. She has no right, right? Because legally she's not married unless you wrote it in a will, unless you created a will and wrote that my wife gets her one eighth share according to Islamic law. If you have a will, you're fine, right? So you could supplement that legal marriage through a will to make sure that your wife inherits. Your kids will inherit, right? Um, you don't, your kids, you know, like uh, we don't have, they're still your lineage. They can still prove that you're the father um, or the mother. And so they would still get their share. It's the wife that's going to be left out of the inheritance unless you wrote a will. Okay. Um, and then... I forgot to ask you about another question with regards to prenup. So let's say you didn't do it before the marriage. Could you do it during the marriage? Yes. Yes. So, uh, uh, there's something called a postnup. So a prenup means prior to the marriage. Postnup means after the marriage. So yes, you could have the exact same agreement, but sign that during your marriage. Yes, absolutely.
Uh, all right. And so the next aspect I want to ask you about is how do courts, if you were to make an argument, let's say divorce happens, if you were to make an argument like, hey, but what about religious freedom? And, you know, and I would like to um, have an imam oversee my divorce. Um, can the court just say, like, you know, reject that? Or can they even accept to that? Like, what's talk to me? Yeah, so the state has jurisdiction over your marriage, right? So number one, if you got a license through the state, then obviously you've submitted to the jurisdiction of the state, you know, too bad, so sad. Um, but also what's very interesting is that the state has power over your children as well, okay? To, I mean, we've all heard of cases where the state takes your kids and, you know, now in California or someplace, you know, they can use the fact that you didn't do gender affirming surgery to against you you know what i mean like there's there's crazy things like that happening um but unless the other side agrees the judge is not going to send you to a religious mediator um or a, a religious arbitrator or a religious judge they're not going to use islamic law they're not going to do any of that unless you had a prenuptial agreement otherwise the default is you're going to use our laws and I don't care that you're Muslim, Christian, Jewish, whatever. The laws of the state is what is going to apply. Actually, you know what? I just remember something else. So I was reading on an article. It was probably like um, a Jewish lawyer. And he was talking about like um, the ju the Judaic law and and having that, you know, like doing their own little prenups before. Yeah. Uh, he said that like, let's say you, the wife and the husband, they have a prenuptial agreement. When they get to the court, she can say, well, I was under duress, and then it just gets thrown out. Is, is that a real thing? It's a real thing. In my, I've been practicing for 10 plus years. I've, I, have, I haven't seen postnuptial uh, prenups or postnups get thrown out. Uh, maybe one, because they gave the power of divorce to some random guy. But... Other than that, I've seen every prenuptial agreement be enforced. And the thing that you have to look at is um, whether there was financial disclosures, whether there was attorneys on both sides, and like you said, whether there was duress. Now, simply saying I was under duress, but you had a lawyer, you were negotiating this for three, four months, you had a settlement conference, you sat in a conference room, you signed and initialed every single page, your lawyer signed off on it. To say that you're under duress, I don't see any judge buying that, right? It'd be different if like you showed up at the wedding hall and everybody's dressed up and then you give the prenuptial paper and say, hey, sign this. Okay, I can see that being duress. But I, I don't, as much as people think that prenuptial agreements are weak, I don't believe that and I don't see that in my practice. Yeah, because I think that's what the article was even arguing. Yeah. You know, he was kind of like, well, you know, if, if you don't have a lot of money anyways and X, Y, Z, um, you know, that prenuptial agreement is not going to be strong. Um, they did mention, however, I think you kind of alluded to this, was that both sides need to have lawyers. And that's what they're going to look at, like representation on both sides, yeah. Which, yeah. which would strengthen the document. Um, exactly. Right. Okay. Uh, the next aspect I want to get into is when you, if you divorced, okay, um should should you let's say a person divorces should they quickly go and lawyer up or or is that necessary or is, is it not what do you think so there's two ways to look at this okay so as a lawyer i would say yes it's important to go to a lawyer quickly so that you understand your rights about money and children right because there's a lot of strategy that is involved in child custody to be honest right um to win as much time as possible to get as much time as possible to be involved in the decisions so i would say talking to a lawyer is very important because if you wait too long there could be some trouble in the court system um also when it comes to money again structuring your money the way that your income is being shown you know so i think from a legal perspective i think you should talk to a lawyer from like a brother's perspective, I would say I I wish that we had our own, you know, systems, right? Our own arbitration, mediation, 
that type of thing because I do want Muslims to try to resolve their divorces on their own through mediators and arbitrators and through elders in the community because that saves a lot of time and money. So as a brother, I would say, please try outside of the court system, right? Please try outside of the court system, go through this program, go through this, go through that so that you're not spending thousands of dollars. But then when I put my lawyer hat on, it's like, well, that three to six months could have some type of impact in the divorce case, right? So it's kind of hard to answer, but you can see, right, as a lawyer versus as a brother. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I think um, uh, which which will also be complementary to that answer is probably it may it may very well de depend on the the relationship you have with your ex spouse yeah. and what type of person they are, what type of person you are with regards sure. to you know honoring uh, um, divorce uh, laws and expectations um, when it comes to Islam. No so, good point. Yeah. Um, the last issue is alimony. Alimony is something that, you know, I, when, you, when you look at Islamic law and you look at the legal system of America, they use a lot of terms that you may think are the same as the Islamic terminology, but it may not be the same. And they may be talking about something totally different. So where is alimony in, in Islamic law? And um, can, is it something that's applied um, uh, automatically uh, during divorce or not? What's going on? Sure. So alimony from the Western perspective are payments from the spouse that made more money to the, sp uh, to the spouse who made less money to either help them get back on their feet to help them um, move on or to kind of maintain a certain lifestyle. Um, and those payments can range from a few hundred dollars to thousands of dollars, depending on how much you make and can last for a few months to for, or for the rest of your life, depending on how long you've been married. So in Illinois, for example, the longer you've been married, the longer alimony payments can go for. And the more you make, the more you would have to pay on a monthly basis. So you have cases where people are paying alimony for 20 years after the divorce. Okay. Islamically speaking, there's, there's nothing like alimony in Islamic law. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's any uh, new fatwas out there, but uh, traditionally speaking, there's no such, there's no such thing as post-divorce alimony. What we're talking about under Islamic law is called nafaqa. Okay. Nafaqa roughly translates to maintenance but it's not the same as alimony or it's not the same as the way that maintenance is used in american law nafaka is talking about the duty that a husband has to maintain his wife right be that um shelter food clothing you know whatever else is customary in that time maybe medical expenses for example may be customary whatever is customary and that lasts until the the marriage is over. Okay, so why do we hear this three-month nafaka, right? What, what are we talking about? What we're talking about is that under Islamic law, if a husband pronounces a divorce, a, you're not divorced right then and there. That's something to clarify. What happens actually is that a three-month waiting period begins. Okay, different, you know, madhabs have different, you know, three, whatever, let's just say three months. What we're talking about is that you have a three month cooling period where the two of you, husband and wife should still live together. And what, what we're trying to do is see if the two of them will reconcile. If there will be any intimacy in this time period, then the divorce doesn't happen. So the divorce is actually valid upon the expiration of that three month period, that three month cool down period. So what we're talking about is that the husband has to still pay for nafaka during that three month separation period. Once that is completed, you're done. There's no such thing as having to pay somebody that you've divorced, that you have nothing to do with. You're not even allowed to be in the same room with them, that now you have to pay them thousands of dollars after the divorce. So alimony is not part of Islam. Um, extended maintenance after divorce is not part of Islam. 
uh, unless of course you signed up for that in your prenuptial agreement and you agreed to that at the outset. Otherwise, there's no such thing as alimony. Um, what would you? I I know that um, it's it's that's true. Uh, there's there's no alimony. We don't have that concept in Islam. However, like how how would you avoid something like that when you're dealing with the legal system? Because a husband could just be sleeping. And is, now the reason why I'm using the husband as examples because uh, with 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 us in in our, in our legal system in the Sharia, the, the the woman cannot divorce, you know, um, right away and like the husband can. She has to go through a separate process, right? So, but if you're married with the courts, a husband could be sleeping in his bed, his wife goes to the courts, to, or assigns those papers, and they're divorced, right? So how how does that work? Because you can't say like tell the judge, look, I'm waiting for three months, <laughs> you know, <laughs> three months. And, uh, you know, he's going to be like, you know, a, a, I'm, I'm sure, you know, the process, the legal process will take some time. But how how does how do people avoid something like that? Um, how does uh, like how does a husband avoid something like having to pay alimony um, at the time of divorce? Prenup. That's the only way. It's either it's either get a prenup, or the other option. And I know I'm not advocating this. This is not my position. But the way that the system is made is that it only works if husband and wife are both working. Mm -hmm. So if you want to avoid alimony, this sounds horrible. And I'm not advocating this, okay? And I'm not condo you know condoning this. But if you really don't want to pay alimony and you're gonna get divorced, have your wife work. You know, astaghfirullah. But that's Either you have a prenup or you have her make as much money as you. That's the only way that you can avoid alimony, unfortunately. If you have a long-term marriage and she makes much, much less than you. If she was a stay-at-home wife and you're making $120,000, and even if she files for divorce, you file for divorce, the judge might still um, award alimony. And so the only way to avoid is really a prenup or a postnup. Yes. Um, I, know, I know we didn't add this in the... I didn't add this a, a part of our discussion today, but but children, um, and it, you know, there's a there's a common misconception that, you know, when um, or maybe it's not, I don't know. You can tell us about that. Um, is when the two get divorced and there's children in the picture, the the chances of those children going to the mother are high, very high. So is that is that true, or are there some nuances to that? No, I think it's true. I think that, it, it, you know, I talked about this recently, like, you know, w we think that there's systemic racism, right? We believe in systemic racism that, you know, um, black people have been, um, you know, subjugated for hundreds of years. And just because we, we passed the Civil Rights Act, we believe that, you know, discrimination is gone. Well, in that same way, the court systems up until the 60s um, were very protective of women that until the 1960s, that's when you had like no fault divorce where you don't even have to prove why you're getting divorced. So many of those, um, systemic issues still apply here where the court system implicitly still believes that mother is best for the kids. Okay. Number one, number two is that the way that the laws are written, they actually look at who was taking care of the kids for the last two years? So if the wife is a stay-at-home mom and I'm the husband, I'm out 10 hours a day earning, well, and the law says that who took care of the kids in the last 24 months? Well, she's going to win left, right, and center, right? Because obviously she's at home. This is how we arranged it. This was our agreement. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the issue is the way that the law is written does favor women um, and I don't think anyone can really deny that. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, for all of that, um, I would give you um, the floor for last advices. Um, what would you give as tips to young Muslims that are about to get married? You know, they're thinking about it. And maybe this has been a topic of discussion. Uh, maybe, you know, the, the, the brother is a professional, up-and-coming professional. He just graduated, got a new job, 
he's a lawyer, he's a, he's a you know, uh, a doctor, something like that. He's just getting married. What would be your advice to him, even the sister as well, inshallah? So, Bismillah, yeah, I, I would actually start, right, I'm going to zoom out a little bit, right? Because as I was saying in the beginning that the whole society doesn't necessarily protect or encourage marriage. We are in a place now where we have 30, 40 year old brothers and sisters who are like, you know what, I don't need to get married. I'm rich. I make money. You know, who cares? But I think that we as a community need to start training our children to be good husbands and wives, to be good fathers, to be good mothers, to be good neighbors and teach our kids that true success and true happiness doesn't come from how much money you make. It comes from the relationships that you have, how strong your relationships are. And so I think from childhood, we need to teach our kids that ultimate happiness will come from a good family life. I think that the con Western concept of marriage based off of romance and love and all of that is a facade that if we look at the Western institution of marriage, it has failed. Right. The, the, the divorce rate in Western societies is over 50 percent. This concept, the, this weird thing that the West has created and called it marriage is nothing like what Islamic marriage is supposed to be. And I believe it has failed. So I think we need to redefine what marriage actually means, what the purpose of marriage is, um, that this is a form of worship. It is a way that we can follow the sunnah of our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that we can express our Islam through how we treat our husband and wife, um, that we can build a family, we could build a community, we could build a society through marriage, um, and really sh use the Islamic spirituality to build ourselves, right? Like we talk about being grateful, we talk about being generous and being kind, controlling our anger. Well, you can learn all about that in the masjid, but the application is with your spouse, right? So, you know, they say um, the Prophet ﷺ said that uh, nikah is half of your deen because you get to show your akhlaq and your adab and how you treat people um, with your spouse. And so my advice to this brother and to this sister, you know, be professional, do what you got to do in your career, but being successful in your careers does not transpose to being successful in your marriage. It's a very different skill. It's a different view. It's a different, um, you know, worldview really. And I think that what I would say to the, these two couples is embrace your masculinity, embrace your femininity and understand that there needs to be some polarization, um, for a successful marriage, right? Um, that, a, a brother is not impressed by a degree, okay? And a sister is not impressed by, um, you know, how much you can necessarily bench. So understand what the other person is looking for um, and use your marriage as a form of worship, um, as a form of raising children. And obviously get a prenup, right? So to end it with kind of what you were talking about, right? The whole reason of this, I know I'm getting all philosophical, but yeah, get a prenup, right? Make sure that not only are you practicing Islam, but that your marriage is also dictated by Islam. Um, so that would be my advice is get rid of the Western programming of marriage, uh, embrace Islamic understanding of marriage and get a prenup. <laughs> Well said. Um, is uh, you know a lot more can be um, uh, said about you know this topic. I do think that the the, the fear I have, brother Navid, is that the Muslim communities right now in America and in the West in general are starting to emulate and um, reflect some of the failing numbers and. Uh, you know, overall, the, the greater um, uh, community in the West of non-Muslims. And um, that's the fear I have. But I do think that the solution you mentioned very clearly is really just be Muslim. You got to yeah. be Muslim. You have to be Muslim before you get married. Yep. And when you get married, it's going to pay off. Right. You know, a lot of times people, they look at things the way non-Muslims look at it. And like you mentioned, it's a materialistic mindset. 
yep. that, you know, people go into these kind of, you know, relationships of marriage. But for us, it's a deeply spiritual thing to where I'm married to you so we can have children for the sake of Allah. And then we can take this family and this could be our passport to the paradise. Right. And so, you know, um, with that aspect, I, I really do hope that, you know, people can watch this and, and learn a lot because when we're mentioning things about prenups and stuff like that, it's not to, uh, you know, have, have one dominate the other or, you know, look out for the brothers, but it's for protection. And in, in this society, we have to protect our communities. We have to protect our families. If you get divorced, get divorced in a good way, right? And that's the part of that protection, uh, protecting the children, protecting, you know, your mind, your property, your deen, all those things are about what we're talking about today. And, you know, um, Zach Malkhair and Brother Naveed, it oh, was yeah. an awesome, awesome conversation. And I know we, we didn't speak as much, but I thought that I think that there's going to be a wealth of information for young Muslims to look at this and, and to really benefit, you know, um, Jazakum al khair. I really yeah. do. No, Jazakum al khair to you and your brothers and for whoever, you know, helps you put this together, inshallah. However else I could be of help in the future, please do let me know. Uh, again, Jazakum al khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Zakum al khair, everyone, deen lovers. Uh, until next time, subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfirka wa natubu lake. One more thing I forgot to mention. Uh, we got to plug the brother in. If you guys want to see much more of uh, Brother Naveed, uh, his content, which is really around uh, what we've been talking today about marriage and, you know, in the perspective of Islam and also um, in his profession, which is, um, you know, divorce uh, law and, 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 and marriage law as well, and especially in the United States, is um, you can look up uh, Brother Naveed. His YouTube channel is... Uh, at Naveed Hussain. We're going to put this um, link on the bottom. And this Instagram is N Hussain, H U S A I N 13. So follow the brother. He has a lot of great uh, uh, content out there with regards to this subject. And if you need help, call him. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, but, you know, Jazak Law Khair, anyways, brother. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi 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 wa r